Welcome back to the channel. Well, today we're over at Ralph's Performance and a buddy of ours has his truck in for a few upgrades. One of the upgrades is a rear end, the same rear end setup that we did in uh, the Undertaker, which is a, a limited slip, modified limited slip. So we're gonna go through the installation and possibly get into some of the other upgrades that this truck has. This truck as of right now has run a best of 11.2, 11.3. Uh, I'll show a quick clip of that. But, uh... Let's dive on in. See what Rob's got going for us. All right, got everything required to get the job done. As we said, this is a modified unit. This is a Ford unit. Uh, where is it? There she goes. There she goes. What size is that? 13 mil. You leave a couple bolts on the top so when you crack it loose, you can you know, get sprayed. You don't want to get a facial? Nah. <laughs> you got to put that video in there. <laughs> Cut! They'll, they'll get it. Use like a thin scraper. Get in between the cover. And the rear end. Housing. And I usually just tap around. And then she's going to start... screwdriver, put a little pressure, and there you go. There she goes. There goes the juice. You don't get all... saturated with this smelly ass stuff. We all know how bad gear oil smells. Are there any visual differences with this? This is what an open uh, diff, right? Yeah, open diff. Um, you're gonna see there's no no S spring for clutches because there's no clutches. Um, and on the electric unit, the lock electric locker unit that would be built on this side here. Um, so. I'll show it to you when I pull it out. You'll be able to see. I don't have an electric unit to compare it to, but well, we have we have video of of mine, so we'll. 
We'll try and bring some of that video in for these guys. But for an open, you see, you push one wheel forward, the other wheel is going to start to go backwards. Um, that's that's how you can find out if it's open or not. If it was a posi unit, both wheels would be tracking the same way, as long as the clutches are still good. You got bad clutches, well, it'll try to grab, but it won't. It, it won't. It won't turn like it's supposed to. All right. So now, while that's draining, we're gonna break these uh, tires loose. I'll start on this side so you guys can see. You're gonna need to take your brake caliper off. That's so we can move the axle. I'm gonna try to use, use as much hand tools just in case you guys don't have air. Yeah, what size is that? Uh, the ratchet for the caliper bolt is a 10 mil. Or gear wrench, I should say. something to hold this forward foot the caliper pins with a hex on it sometimes you can't get your wrench in there while this thing is tight so I usually use the tape pliers just to hold it just so you can crack it loose and you want to just lift up slide off let it hang I usually just take the front pad off that allow the axle to slide out you don't need to take the rotor off because the axle will be able to you slide the axle out about an inch and a half two inches Kind of like just let it hang because we're not doing anything with the axle bearings because the thing has low mileage, so um, I don't usually pull it all the way out. Over to this side, same deal, same size. Fire, just kind of hold it, crack and loose. If you don't hold the, the caliper pin, it's gonna just try to rotate on you. Or if you have a real thin wrench, which I probably have, but most people have a pair of pliers handy. You don't wanna go on top of the boot, you just wanna grab it right at the hex area. That'll just be enough to crack and loose and then by hand you should be able to just take the uh, caliper bolt out. Same deal, lift up, pull off, let it hang, front pad off. Okay, we're gonna go in here. I always do a backlash check, so that's what I'm gonna do first before I even pull any of the axles out. Um, even though it's a Ford unit, in theory it should fit with no problem. Um, you should be able to utilize the actual um, the shims the holes to carry in there, but I always double check um, and make sure that where I started from is where I'm gonna end at. And uh, that's what I'm gonna do right now, but the first thing I have to do is I'm gonna have to put this thing in neutral. Um, so I don't know how you guys, some of you guys can do this on the ground, just make sure you, you're safe and you got some type of jack stands um, and you can throw it in neutral or whatever. If you got a dial indicator, which I'm gonna show you how I usually check it. 
Um, usually Fords, they usually tend to set them up anywhere from eight to 10. I usually like my gears around 10 on something like this. Um, but we're gonna see. This rear has never been open before, so we're gonna see where Ford actually put it at. And if it's a little bit on the tight side, I tend to just like leave it alone. Um, but as long as we're in the ballpark, um, usually I check um, in three different spots. And if everything looks good, we send it. So now I just disconnected the shifter linkage. You guys don't have to do that again. You can just put it in neutral from, you know, turn the key on, step on the brake, put it in neutral. Um, but I just go up under here, so I don't have to climb inside the truck um, and just pop the actual uh, shifter cable off, off of the actual transmission and just throw it in neutral. Um, so I can get access to rotating this thing so I can check it in three different points. So the first thing you need to have is a nice clean surface so your dollar and your kid doesn't slide around. So that's what I'm going to do now. A nice scraper with a nice edge. Clean them up. I usually knock off all the heavy stuff first. Here, you know, you can pick this up from anywhere. This is a yeah, comp cam. Up a little. This is a comp cam one. I use it for a lot of different things. Been with me for years. Never let me down. Um, I just lay them up here. Okay, I'm about to reset them. Lay them up here. Make sure your 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 base of your dial indicator is is on a nice flat surface. You want to get up under the gear, a little bit of an angle. No rocking that you're gonna get no you're not gonna get any incorrect readings from the actual base rocking around so that's pretty tight so then I usually roll it up then roll it back down so it gets a little bit like on the nose of the gear bring it to zero and then you just want a light pressure see what your backlash is so on this one it's coming up about 12 thousandths, which is still within specs, okay? I don't know if you guys can really see that, but if you want to bring the camera around, and I'll show them up and down here. So set on zero, and you just roll it back to the stops. You don't want to force it. You just want to see the actual play between the two gears. So we're about 12 thousandths, right, on that one. And then I'll just rotate them again, lift your, your, your tool up, yeah, that looks great. Make sure you're still good where it's at. It's not rocking around. You're not getting any incorrect readings. Roll this back down to zero. Twelve. So we know we're starting out with twelve thousands. So when we go back in with the new unit to keep everything identical, we should have twelve thousands again. Do you have any more? Um, if you have a little bit less, it's not a big deal. You can do a pattern check. You're not really gonna get a real good reading on a used gear already, but you can still check, you'll get some type of reading. 
But as long as you're with us back, usually you are, um, just by doing these uh, carry swaps. I have yet to have, have to uh, add any shims, and hopefully today it doesn't bite us. We'll find out in a few. So the next step, we're gonna go ahead and uh, pop these axles out. So you gotta rotate the carrier so you can get up to the actual cross pin or the center pin. And that's gonna be a 5 16 wrench. It's gonna be a 5 16 wrench. Just cracking loose and then run him out. You can use a quarter drive ratchet with a you know 516 so 8 mil socket. Um, on these trucks you got a little bit more room to do that. On a 88 and a Fox, you won't be able to get a ratchet in there, but I'm using a wrench so you guys can see. There's the pen, pull him out. Once you pull the pin out, he just starts Woo. sliding on his own. <laughs> she loose. She, yeah, I see. So now, once you do that, you're able to go ahead and push the axles in to get the clips out. Okay? The other thing is, let's just check something here. So this is, this is going to be part of the video. Put that back in. So, axle in play, very important. And we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about axle in play on what's supposed to be there. But I just want you guys to see that, just by me moving the axle in and out, if I had to guess, it's probably like somewhere around like eight thousandths, okay? A lot of guys are doing these swaps and shaving down this clip and, and they're creating more axle in play. So I'm gonna get back to that in a little bit. But I just want you to see from factory, Ford, how much in play. Like I said, it's probably like five to eight hours. It's not, not that much, but it's enough to allow the axle to float a little bit. Go again. So this side, it has a little bit more to show you. It's very little, but it's just a matter of what the axle is going in and out when it contacts this pin. It's supposed to float. It shouldn't ride. These axle ends shouldn't ride on this pin because then you're going to have material starting to chew. It's going to chew away at the pin. We don't want that. But I'm just showing you guys on what's coming next as far as the, the install. We're going to slide that out and rotate this back down. Right? Now, we're going to push the axle in. Now we have access to the C clip. To the actual C clip. Take your like, little pocket rocket screwdriver. Rotate them around and give them a push. They'll fall down in there, grab them, put them to the side of maybe a clean paper towel or a rag because you're going to be using them for later. Now that the axle is in, we're going to pull the axle out just enough so we'll be able to get the carrier out. So I usually pull them out. About that much there. So if you can leave your rotor on. Or if you're scared because something, a kid or somebody's walking around, you can just take the axle uh, off. It's not a big deal. But you don't have to take the actual loader off. You can kind of just let it float around on there. Again, get that one push. Pull it out. Now we're going to pull the axle out. Now we're going to take the C clip. So you got the two half moves kind of like facing you. A little pocket rocket screwdriver. Give it a push. Then fall it down. Again, you can put them on like a clean rag or something because you're going to be using them. Pull the axle out, and that's it. That's all you need right there. Now we already got our measurements of what the backlash is, so we have a starting point. So when we go back together, you know, we don't have any problems, or we don't, you know, if, if we don't check, then we put this thing back together and we're like, oh, why is this thing making noise or doing something weird? Because you could potentially change the actual, um, the distance of the gear contact, you know what I mean? So, and that will be in the shims and whatnot, okay? 
So I'm gonna go ahead and take this loose. I usually go ahead and I'll, I usually mark these caps. Um, the old 88s used to have arrows on them. We kind of made it idiot proof. These new caps are not that much idiot proof. Uh, sometimes you'll see if you clean up the carrier, what you're gonna see when I clean them up. Inside, it'll usually sometimes be a paint mark, but you have to get in there to see that. So instead of doing all of that, I'll usually just take a punch, you know, my left side would be number one, so I put one dimple here, one dimple there. And then this side would be two. I put two dimples there, two dimples there. Then you can clean up the, clean the actual um, the caps up, and then you can install them. And they do go on one way. Um, so your two, your two dots need to be lined up with each other versus if you flip it, it'll be something that'll catch your eye if you happen to do that. You do not want to flip these or cross these. As um, far as what I was told and the years I've been doing this, um, this thing is kind of like line home, so they're kind of dedicated, so you don't want to mess around and do that. Um, don't quote me on that, but that's what I was told, and I never mismatch the actual uh, caps. So I'll just take like a punch, you know. So I'll put two dimples, one. Two, one, two. So I know those two are gonna line up and this cap is for this side. If I happen to flip this thing and I see those two dots down there, well, I know I messed up. And then I usually just put one there and one there. So the main cap bolts, they're 15 mils. Okay. You can use a little elbow grease, you know, cracking loose with a hand ratchet. This is where I said some parts I'm gonna use air, some parts I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna use my manual, so you can crack them loose. I'll show you how easy it is. Give me a three eighths wrench. So got air. So now the two dimples I was telling you about, I don't know if you guys can see them. I could probably highlight them or something. But I know this cap belongs on the right side. So I don't have to worry about crossing them up and stuff like that. So I can just lay them down there. No, three eight. Uh, uh, um, ratchet. And if you guys have cordless impacts and stuff, they work great. Um, we're not going to be drawing it back in like that. Um, you can use it just to run them in nice and slow. Um, but, you know, all this stuff needs to be torqued. So, it's just a matter of just breaking them loose. You know, it's not, not all that difficult. So, you just go ahead and run them out. Take them. And then now, at that point, we can have these things cleaned up, so these are gonna disappear for a minute because I'm getting to my guys so you can clean them up in the tank. The other thing is, a lot of guys, um, this rear should be nice and tight from forward. Um, I see, I seen a lot of cars come in where I do gears, and I literally just pull this carry out by hand. If I can pull this thing out by hand, that means it's not preloaded correctly. Hopefully, it doesn't just come out by hand. So it doesn't come out by hand. So now this is where you're gonna need a pry bar to actually get this guy out. You gotta use a little effort. Now, if you're a little scared, you could actually leave one of the caps back on um, so it doesn't come at you 100 miles an hour and, and total out your, your outfit and, <laughs> and, you, and yourself. Um, so I usually just get up in here like this and I'll pry. Give me a cap so I can just show these guys what I'm about to. Just give me one cap. It doesn't matter which one it is. Now, just as far as what I can feel, she's in there. So, this one was done right. So, I usually just take it, stick one hand in there, and I'll just pull, I mean push on the bar and pull on the top. Leverage. There you go. So, you need something with a little bit of ass on it, you know what I mean? get you a bar again if it's on the ground you just don't want to you don't want to pry against the gears um you can probably grab one of these 
uh, side bolts if you want it to try to pry, but the thing about that is it's going to try to rotate. I usually grab it here and hold it at the top so it can't rotate. I kind of put a little force down and pry at the same time and she'll come on out of there. Now, what I just did there, you don't want to do that, but I know it's still got enough pressure there to hold it. So at this point, she's still in there. So now, again, you take the pry bar very lightly, just give it a little pressure, and she'll start to come out. Now, so your, your shims and your um, braces don't go flying, just take two hands, one on each end, take your race, you don't want to mix these up. But remember, we're going back. We're not trying to reset the whole rear end back up. So this actual shim needs to go on this side. So just to keep track of where it's at, if you're working on the ground, you can put it to the side. Sometimes I'll just lay them right here on top of the leaf spring. And then this side here, I'll lay on top of the leaf spring. And the shim, I'll lay on top of the leaf spring. And now the unit's out. Okay. So I'm gonna take this over to the bench, then we're gonna get back to this in a few minutes because we need this ring gear off of here. Now I'll hit this up with some brake clean. You don't have to get too crazy with the brake clean. You can just rinse them out a little bit. Just so you have a nice clean area to work in. And also, when, you, when it's time to reseal this guy, you don't have to worry about gear oil trying to run down and get between your sealant and the actual cover and then possibly having uh, some sealing issues there. So let me clean some of this out of here so you can see as we go along. So I use a can of brand new can of brake clean. I got like a little brush. I might be going a little overkill, but I like stuff to be a little clean, so just give it a little spray down. It's not gonna hurt nothing. I spray, scrub at the same time. You'll start to see the case will start to come as natural color. thing is if you get the gear clean if you have to do a pattern check you don't have to worry about oil uh, oil being contacted between the gears when you use um, a type of paint compound so I'm gonna use very light air just to show you guys take a pick. You don't have to, but I usually go in here. Just make sure there's no uh, silicone. These are, these are blind holes up in here. Um, just to make sure there's no silicone, because what will happen is if it's silicone in there and you go to put your bolt in and you go to torque it up, I've seen where the head actually snap off because you're actually compressing silicone between the inside of the actual case where, where it's a dead hole and you're not getting a proper torque reading. So some guys don't torque them, they just run them in my hand. Whatever's comfortable for you, I usually torque them up at the spec and we'll get to that in a little bit. Alright, so I got a, a Ford Performance unit here, uh, 15 and up Mustang. Uh, Posi unit that we have modified to work with um, the F-150 Super 88 rears. Uh, a lot of guys out there are um, they're shaving down clips, they're hammering clips in, the C-clips I'm talking about, uh, to get this thing to actually work. Yeah, the unit is fine. It's based, it's based off the same thing because it is a Super 88. Um, but the problem with that is a lot of guys are they're shaving down the C-clips where you get too much in play. Um, me, I like to have things the way Ford had it, as uh, far as uh, in play on the axle and whatnot. Uh, the other bad part about you know guys that are not shaving the clips down, they're um, they're hammering them in, and uh, when you use a hammer and some type of screwdriver, you're knocking them in. Well, what about if you want to take this thing back apart? Um, 
it's kind of a you know what to get out you know what i mean so and you got a very small space to work with if you had to get that clip out if you left the, the, the actual stock c clip uh the stock thickness and um, i'm going to show you guys the stock thickness of a, of a c clip and um but basically you don't have to do that anymore with the uh, modifications that we've done for these for these units uh so you can run these and an f-150 uh, they have a, a Super 88 in it, and uh, we're going to show you how to do that in a little bit. Alrighty, so we got the uh, the stock unit and the full performance Super 88 unit sitting here on the on the bench. Uh, I'm just going to go over a couple things. What's the difference? Uh, Dwayne is asking. As far as an open uh, opens, as you can see, if the pin was sitting in here, it just spins around. So one side will go forward, the other one go, you know, reverse. So that's an open unit. Um, that's where they had the one wheel wonder when you, you know, one side would plant, the other one would come like, you know, do a burnout. Uh, it would never be a positive unit because you never have these uh, side gears locked in to actually, to actually do a burnout to, to move forward. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's why they kind of just like float around like that. So this one here, I can't do this with this. They have clutches in there. This S spring is to actually keep pressure on the actual, um, uh, side clutches that are in this positive unit. And, uh, the way this works is, uh, when the ring gear itself, uh, gets power from the pinion, it actually forces these, these, this actual S spring actually helps push pressure here and allow this thing to actually do burnouts. And the reason why they call it limited slip is when you go around a turn, if you're making a right turn, um, you're making a right turn, the left wheel is gonna be moving faster than the actual right wheel, because the right wheel is gonna try to, it's, it's gonna do like a pivot deal. So that's why it allows this thing to be a limited slip. That's how this works. Um, so what we're gonna do now here is, uh, just wanna make sure you guys see, this is a Ford unit, 88, Posi unit. Um, from Oko right here so and this here is the stock 18 f-150 uh, open diff deal so we're gonna this is the part you're gonna need some air or a good vice um, to actually hold this unit uh, matter, matter of fact let me just continue like if, if you're at home and you're gonna need some type of vice or a real strong friend <laughs> to hold it um, if you have a vise you don't need to apply a lot of pressure um, you can you can actually just have the vise you grab it right here um, like again you don't need to kill it because you don't want to distort anything definitely on the new unit that you're using um, I mean the old unit we don't really care if it's electric locker or if it's a uh, open carrier um, so you want to take these uh, these bolts out here it's a 13 16 uh, socket. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just rip these apart. I'm gonna leave one so you can see by me doing it by hand. Uh, another little trick if you need some leverage, I'll show you. So I left the one like I said. I was gonna leave. Let me kill it there. So here I got a half inch extension. Okay, guys, probably like, all right, what are you gonna do with that? So if you need a little bit of leverage. Uh, you know you're going to be breaking this thing loose this way. So what you could do is you could put this in there or just give me an idea what you could do. And that's how you break it loose. So you have, you're pushing this way because you're going the other way with the ratchet to break it loose. Uh, you got air or some type of uh, electric impact, it works just fine. Because uh, those bolts are usually probably on there about, um, about 85 pounds. That's why I go ahead and I'll just use my air. So I don't have to fight with it. Now at this point, you could leave a bolt in it or two. A um, couple turns in. The whole point is you want to put some bolts on here. So if you're using the vise like this, or if you're on a on the shop bench and you knock this gear down, it doesn't just go crashing down onto whatever surface is, is below it. You're gonna need a good hammer uh, with some ass on it and um, a nice drift or a punch. Just go, give it a couple 
shot. Like that there. I think she's loose. Doesn't take much. So I'm gonna go over here, take this bolt back out. Just lift off. And now you got your ring gear. And I already had my guy clean this up. So the surface, well on the gear surface is nice and clean already. So I'm just gonna clean up this back surface a little bit. So now we're ready to install this guy on the new unit. So I usually just go ahead and I'll just put this in the middle, put this like this, and then you want to line up your bolt holes. I'll usually just kind of like walk it around just to get it started, you know, kind of evenly. Okay. All, right, All right, so we got some new hardware here. Um, anytime you do the um, Ford now, you used to be able to reuse the actual uh, ring gear bolts. Um, so specs on those are 44 foot pounds and then uh, I think like 90 degrees. Uh, so you're gonna need like a torque angle wrench and I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, so I usually put like a little red Loctite on the actual threads. It already has some on there. Um, but before you do that, what I usually do is I'll go here and I'll just put a few bolts in because we gotta we gotta bring this ring gear up. So I'll go one, every other one. And then what I'll do is run this up in a star pattern. Nice and slow so it gets even. So now that thing is ran up. I'm gonna put this back in the vise just so you guys so it doesn't wobble around. You guys can actually see what's going on. Plus, I'm gonna do the actual torque that they want. So I just use the bolts just to run them in. So you put a little dab on there. You run them in there, and then you're also gonna torque, torque these down in a star pattern as well. All right, so I'm using a uh, Snap-on 3 8 uh, torque wrench, digital deal. Got it set at 44 foot-pounds. So we're gonna go in the star pattern. So like before, I kind of just like ran them down, just a contact. So that's that one. And we're gonna go over here. That's that one. And we're gonna go over here. Now that all of them are at 44 pounds, so like I said, that's the 3 8 guy because my half inch doesn't go down that low. Then we got the 13 16 socket. This is my half inch guy, so I put them on the table to wear them out. All right, so now this also has degrees. Ford asks for 90 degrees. All right, so that's 90 degrees. So what I'm gonna do is, just so we know which ones we did already, I'm gonna mark, I put a like white paint marker so you don't wanna hitting the same one and giving it 180. You wanna just give them each 90 degrees. Mark them, you know, that's your starting point. Make a nice line on it so you can see from the, from the actual housing to the actual bolt. So when you go over everything, you don't mess around and lose track or if your phone rings or something, you get distracted or an old lady comes outside and says dinner's ready, ready. you know where you left off at. All right, so those are all done. You can also number these if you want it, you know. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and this is where, where I was telling you guys, 
this bar comes in handy because I'm going to be pulling against me. So I'll kind of lean up against this and then I'm going to go in the star pattern as well, 90 degrees. So that's your 90 degrees. So basically it came up as from 44 foot pounds to 90 degrees came up to about 150 pounds. Same deal over here. Now you want to just double check all your white marks. Everybody should be 90 degrees. Okay. So everybody's done. Now you cannot re-90. That's why they call torque to yield bolts. So once you once you do it, that's it. All right, so now the other fun part is, I know you all said you guys can do it at home. You gotta press, you're good, you don't. Well, um, there is a way that you can do bearings. You can, you can get them on there. Um, you can knock them on, but the tricky part is trying to, you'll get it down, but you need to make sure this guy's completely flush down here. Um, so you would need some type of uh, some type of race tool or something to to do that. Um, I have a lot of uh, old bearings and I keep the old center sections of them, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. But if you guys have um, a uh, if you guys have like a seal installer kit. Uh, you can you can you can start the actual be uh, bearing to go on there, but you don't want to just knock it on until it's flush. It needs to go past this point, and I'll show you why. So here I got a set of OEM bearings. You can get all this stuff from Ford, or if you took the number and crossed it over. So the bearing itself um, is a ST5183. You can probably punch that in like a Napa, Advance Auto, or O'Reilly's, whatever's near you uh, for the bearing. Um, Koyo makes makes the ones for uh, for Ford, and the actual race for it would be a ST fifty one eighty three dash two. Um, I like getting the Ford stuff, so I because I know what I'm getting once I receive it. Um, so now this is where you don't want to use this to knock this on. So you don't do that. So you want to make sure you get on there kind of square. And um, this is like a race installer tool or um, axle seals. This tool works with. So you want to make sure you find a race that actually fits the surface and not on top of the actual cage of the bearing. Um, so you can make sure it's square before you knock it down. Now she will go down. And I'm going to show you, you can knock them down, but you still really need a press to get them in. But this is for the guys that don't have a press. So you see how I held my hand on it so it doesn't try to... The actual flat part of this tool is to try to roll over there and then I kind of get cocked and then bend the cage. If you bend the cage, you need a new bearing. Now, this bearing is not 100% all the way down. Um, it's down, but I always take, um, I'll show you guys what I use um, when I'm in the press and I'm gonna actually press the other side so you guys can see for, for the guys that have a press um, to make sure this thing is completely down. So let me grab the other little piece. So this basically is an old piece uh, 
this is the a bearing without the actual rollers um, so the cage is missing um, sometimes depend on if I don't have the tool to actually do pressing it comes in handy I can actually use it as a pressing tool um, this guy here his diameter is bigger than this side would be so in this case you can actually lay this on top like I was telling you before you kind of get creative for if you don't have the tool or whatever um, some people may say it's like makeshift and you know it's like backyard to do but um, if you're in a tight pinch and these cars are constantly being you know updated with new stuff I have all the four tools to do the stuff um, but I ran into a pinch where I was like crap I don't have the actual proper uh, pressing tool for this bearing at the time so this is one piece I had laying around so I'm going to show you you know if you, you don't have one of these but it's the idea, the diameter would need to be bigger than, it needs to be bigger where it can slide over, okay? But also, it can't, you don't want it to be too big where it, it grabs the cage of the actual bearing. So I'm gonna sit this center. Then I'm gonna use the same tool that I had so now, I know this is centered, I'm not on the cage. This is tight in the vise. I'll give it a nice, nice smack. Now that thing is on there. I know I felt it go down a little bit. You can give it another shot, another shot. Now that thing is down completely. So you wanna just make sure you can look and see, you know, if you got any daylight, you can actually take a light and shine behind behind it to make sure let me get it the other light so basically you just want to make sure you you don't have any daylight between the case and the actual bottom part of the bearing that's down here so now she's down all the way you know, if you wanted to see if it's any daylight, you kind of put it and like look around. And the main thing is not to have any daylight up under the bearing, um, because then when you go to put your shims in and stuff, you're like, what the heck is going on? I can't get this thing in because it's probably because the bearing's not pressed all the way down. So now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to the to the press. I might have to set the press up. You guys that get a better pressing this in. Now, the actual cage of this bearing sits out Hi. further. Sorry. <laughs> the, the actual cage of this bearing, this part that I'm rattling around, sits out further than the surface of the actual carrier does. So you never want to sit this flush on your press because you'll, you'll damage the cage. So what I usually do is I'll put a, I'll put like a spacer here that's actually smaller smaller on the inside um, it's actually smaller than this actual cage so I don't have to worry about running into the risk of uh, crushing this you know like this um, you know so it when you go to press it you're pressing on the surface of this part you're not pressing on there make sure it's square in there Take this guy, lay him up here. Same deal on this part, you don't want to be on the cage. Make sure the bearing is square as possible. So when you start to press, the actual bearing goes down nice and square. that's on the bottom is not contacting this cage that's what we don't want and this one is free as well so now I'm gonna take that other little 
makeshift tool that I said I had. So I'm taking the same tool, just make sure that this thing is 100% square. You know, that this bearing is all the way down onto the actual carrier so we don't have any issues. And I'm also going to just double check on the other one, even though I know it's all the way down. back over here um, and install it into the actual truck. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and lube up, always lube up the bearings um, before you put them in the races so it's, there's no dry run. Um, definitely when you're going down the road and whatnot, even though you, you fill this up, it doesn't throw oil over here right away. Um, so always lube everything up. Um, I use the Ford stuff, the 75W85 uh, synthetic, that's what it calls for. And also the Ford Racing uh, additive. You just need one bottle of this for the actual clutches, for the, um, for the actual posi in it. So what I used to do is I'll take, take a little bit and I'll just like, I'm just gonna try to show you guys, kind of like just squeeze it right in the middle of where the needle bearings are at, just to lubricate it a little bit. <laughs> take the actual race running around a few times. It'll actually start to wet, wet, wet up the race with oil. Then I'll flip it. Do the same deal on this side. You know, you don't have to go crazy, but just a little bit, just to, you wanna make sure that thing is nice and lubed up so you don't have any dry runs when you go to actually test it. Then what I'll go ahead and do Take your, your shims that came out originally. You can just wipe those down with a rag. Is this like good? Hmm? The lights are? No, the lights okay. are. So I usually wipe down the rape, uh, the actual shim, the side shim that we're gonna be using for this side. This is the side it came out of. So I'll wipe him down. Now I'll grab the other one. Do the same deal, clean him off. And you want to put these in the exact same spot it came out of so you don't have to reinvent the wheel by trying to check backlash and messing up and whatnot. You can kind of get it in. Like I said, usually they go in pretty good. Um, I have yet to have to change shims. So I take one, one shim I'll put on this side because this is the side that's going to go on with the ring gear. And I'll grab the other race, same deal, flat side towards the actual bar uh, uh, towards the race, the beveled edge towards the actual housing. Then I'll go ahead and lay them up in there. And then you want to kind of just put it in nice and even. The shim's in. Uh, and the tool, it's a four tool rotunda. It's got like a half moon deal. And this is the back end that you hit. So basically, this actually um, straddles the actual um, shim. It straddles it? Straddles it. Okay. What else you call it? <laughs> Just ask. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can rotate it a little bit. That'll actually help for the actual, to knock the shims in. Be 
careful because you can crack the shim. I don't use a real heavy hammer either. Um, just because it should be light taps to get them in there. You know, I don't want, I won't use a big, like, ball peen hammer. You know what I mean? Nothing with too much weight. Little taps, it should go in there. So then you'll actually hear when the actual shim bottoms out, the tone will change. That's it. It's in there. And then you go over to this side. Again, you can rotate it. That'll help it out a little bit. I'm going in. You see the, 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 the tone of, of the actual shim, me hitting it, you'll hear a different tone. You hear like more like a solid. That's it, it's all the way in there. Feels like it. And we're gonna check it in a minute. You see, and the shim's all the way in. So now we're gonna go back to our caps. I pre-marked them before. This is the one with the single dot. Single dot was over here. Okay. So I have my guy clean all this stuff up. I usually put like a little oil back on the threads. But we took all the oil off of this thing completely. So my dot was up here. I know this guy belongs on this side and he was facing up. Same deal with this one. This one has the two dots. I know that faces up. So I'm gonna loop up under the head of the actual bolt and the threads. He's lubing the head. Lubing the head. 15 mil, like we used before to take it apart. You can run it nice and slow, evenly. All right, so now, let me get the torque specs for this. We're gonna torque this down, and then we're gonna check the backlash again. Um, you never want to try to recheck the backlash without the caps. This thing needs to be torqued in how it would be going down the road. Uh, torque specs on the main cap bolts are 83 foot pounds. up there sounds like the backlash is good but we're gonna go ahead and just double check it again with the dial indicator So I'm gonna roll it back so I get to zero. And we are at 12. Like 11 and a half, 12. So we're good. We're still within specs. Again, if you wanna roll it to another spot, we're gonna go like 180 just to see, or you can check in, in three different spots.
I usually use the pan to roll it back to zero instead of trying to do it by hand here. So then it's already preloaded. I'll rotate it to the right. So then all I gotta do is pull down to get my number. So we're at 11 and a half. So we're good there. I'll just check another spot. For you guys. We're gonna roll it back to zero. So I'll rotate in the rear to the right by the pinion. And you want to be on the nose of the gear, not on the edge of it, but like towards the edge of it. We still got a flat surface that you can contact. 11 and a half, so we're good to go. So before we started out with 12, we had 11 and a half, that half of, that's not gonna affect anything. Um, pretty sure if I was to do a, a pattern check, um, again, sometimes when you have gears that are ran already, it may look a little goofy if you was to try to check that, but um, for the most part, we're, we're within specs. Um, this thing will go down the road, no noises, and um, we're good to go. So, I mean, if you want to go over everything one more time, just to make sure your torques is, your everything's all torqued up. You know, you can just check your main caps again. They used to be four pounds, and that's what I usually do. We good there. We good there. We good there. And we're good there. Alrighty, so now, what we're gonna do is, it's time to put the axles back in. So I'm gonna rotate this guy about here, and I'm gonna slide the axles in. Okay, so now this is the part that I'm gonna readdress from, from earlier uh, when we modify the actual posi unit. Um, see how now the, the axle actually protrudes all the way through? So now you can slide that seat clip in there without having to grind it down. A lot of guys are because normally this thing would be somewhere in here, half showing, or quarter, I should say midway showing, and then they're they're actually you can you can get you can get it started, but then if you had to knock that thing in there, it's a pain in the ass to try to get that clip back out if you ever had to service this thing. Um, and then what the what other guys are doing, they're they're taking the actual C clip itself, maybe putting on a belt sander, and they're probably knocking out you know, about a hundred something thousands. They're making it thinner to slide in there so they could pull their axle. But what happens is when you do that, yeah, you got the clip in there and you'll be able to get it in and out because you shaved it down. You just took the integrity. You just made the actual, uh, this thing doesn't have any C-clip laminators or anything like that to keep the axle from coming out. So it relies on that little clip. So by you taking that clip and you shaving it down and making it thinner, well, you're making it weaker. What's the odds of it really coming apart? Well, you know we, what we do with these things. Um, we're out here drag racing. We're out here having fun. Um, but I put that in, in my car? No, not, not, not at all. Um, that's why I had to start doing a little digging in, into this unit. You know, being as though it's a Super 88 unit, uh, I figured, well, it should work. Um, so we actually uh, modified it and, and made it work um, with no problems. And we're still going to retain our... Uh, our in play for our axle in play on the actual uh, cross pin that goes here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in the um, the actual C clip on this side, and then I'll put the C clip on that side. You know, put the axle in, put the C clip on, and then I'm gonna slide the uh, the actual cross pin in and show you what, what it looks like with that. A stock C clip hasn't been machined. You can see the original mark from when it was riding in there. These are not brand new. They're not something I made up. These are the actual stock C-clips. Uh, if you purchase a unit uh, from us or send us one to machine or whatever, we will not be providing these pieces. This, this here is the stock pieces that you're gonna reuse, okay?
So you slide that in and you push that in just like that, just like it's supposed to, it's like, it's like it belongs there, like it's from factory, okay? And then you pull it back and that's it. So now I'm gonna go over here in there. See how far it sticks out? You can go ahead and just slide that right in there. Pull it back. Now that's in there like that. You're gonna rotate the pinion. We're gonna slide the pin in. There's nothing done to the pin. This is the stock pin that came with the Ford Performance Super 88. You're gonna put a little blue Loctite on the threads of the pin. Put them in there. Ford calls for the torque on that to be 25 foot pounds. Again, if you can get pinion, and I'll tighten it up. That's good. That ain't going nowhere. She locked in there. I'm happy. That's it. Now, when you put the units in, you have to use like a little rubber mallet. It's gonna be a little tighter. I have some very, very, very little in play. As the clutches start to wear, it'll start to gain a little bit more in play. That's why it's kind of critical for you not to shave the pit, uh, the actual clips. You shave the clip, you made that thin, so you can get that in, so you can get the actual axle clip in. Now, this just you just made this more to travel even more then when the, when the actual clutches start to wear, it's gonna even go even more, and then you start to get more in play this way. You don't want that. So when you put these units in that we machined, it's gonna be a little bit on the tight side, but it's fine, because as you start to drive, you're gonna, the, the clutches are going to actually break in and wear, and you're gonna get some in play. Um, so don't, don't be concerned about, you know, is it gonna mess up anything? Um, you know, because if you're having a little bit of time getting it in, like I say, you can just give a little tap with like a little mallet. You see how I just knocked it in? It went in no problem. Put the cross pin in with a little bit of blue Loctite, 24 or 25 foot pounds. You're good to go. And then if you ever have to take this thing back apart, it'll be just as simple as how we put it in. You don't have to worry about anything and um, worry about the axles moving around and, and having too much play there. All right, so now that's all torqued. That's all. Well, I hand tighten that. These are all torqued up. The ring gear bolts all torqued up. We checked our backlash. We're good. <clears throat> We're good there. <clears throat> our surfaces are clean. Um, you're gonna have a little bit <clears throat> of residual oil from when we put oil on the actual carrier bearings. It's running down, so you want to wipe that up. So when you go to put your silicone on, you don't have to worry about this happening. It dripping down and get in between your sealant and the cover. So I'm gonna go ahead and just wipe that little residual that's draining down. So when we go to put the cover on, we don't have to worry about it interfering with our sealant. Rewipe the surface of the rear. Now I'm going to wipe the surface of the actual diff cover. Now I have my guy put the cover in the parse washer and cleaned everything up for me. Same, same way I cleaned the actual rear end surface, you know, with a, a scraper and some Scotch-Brite. 
and a little bit of brake clean, and you'll be good to go. Same deal over here. You know, I put in the parts washer, I always wipe it down. So, I'll show you how clean it looks. You could damn near eat out of it. Okay, so that's nice and clean. I use right stuff. Stuff seals really good. So now I'm gonna go over here and leave about crazy with it. Both services are clean. <clears throat> there are three studded bolts. They have specific location. I'll show you that in a minute. Always make sure the silicone is off of the, the tips of the actual bolts. Um, basically you don't want that. You don't want to run that in there and it bottoms out in there and it'll allow, it won't allow the bolt to get actually torqued up properly. So the three studs, the, the three bolts that we took out that have the like little studs on top of them, they're actually to hold the ABS harness and the electric uh, parking brake harness. So one goes here, one goes up here, the other guy goes over here. And then the rest of the bolts go in their places. So 13 mil again, I'm just going to run them in, nice and soft there, in a crisscross pattern as well. So Ford calls for 33 foot pounds on the cover bolts, some people don't torque them, some people just run them in. I pretty much torque, try to torque everything that I can. So you're talking in the star pattern as well, same deal. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is, um, being though this was an open rear, um, normally, uh, so for you guys that have uh, the electric locker unit in this le left top hand corner here, normally there's uh, a wire harness that comes over here where the connector will go in to power up the actual locker unit that's on this side here. So when you take out your, your old carrier, uh, the connector's still there. You can leave it connected. I usually cut the end off of the um, if you don't if you're not ever if you're never going to go back to the stock electric locker unit you can just cut the the end off of it make the wires flush with the connector and you can actually connect the connector back on so no um, gear oil and whatnot can just be can get inside of the actual terminal if you want or you can leave it open it doesn't really matter it's not going to hurt anything um, as you know. You don't need to um, try to activate the rear locker in the car. You don't have that. Uh, you don't have that anymore. So you don't need to actually pull it to um, engage it because it's not there anymore. Because um, you have uh, posi traction all the time now. So you can still use your four x four like you normally would use, but you don't need to try and pull that because it does nothing at that point. You just got rid of that option. So now you're gonna just put these guys back where they came from. Put that there. 
This goes there. That one goes there. And that one goes there. And that's how that wire goes there. And that's how Ford had it. So we put it back. And now uh, we're done. With that, all we gotta do is now just put back the actual rotors and uh, the one pad and and the brake calipers. So let's put that back, one there. You put your pad back on. We don't need that brace there anymore. Lay this guy back up here. need the pliers to actually hold it at that point. Once it, once it catches, you can just grab and tighten it. Nice and hand tight. I know I said torque pretty much everything, but this is not one of them. Torque your wheels up. I use torque sticks. I torque them down to about 120 pounds. That's what this torque stick is ready for. I'm gonna go over to the other side. And uh, with the right stuff, that stuff actually cures. It cures pretty fast on the silicone. Um, you don't really have to wait that long. I like to let the stuff dry up a little bit. Um, so, you know, if you want to go in the house, eat some lunch, or find something else to do, or maybe wipe the car down or something, you can do that, or the truck, for that matter. But um, I usually let the stuff sit. Um, this stuff actually cures a lot faster than. Um, some of the other Permatex stuff. Um, and it's actually really durable and I yet had a leak with using that product. Um, but uh, you can literally seal it up. By the time you're done putting this other caliper on, I mean the other rotor and caliper on, putting the wheel on, you can get ahead and, and fill up the, uh, the differential. Um, I've done it when I have cars that, you know, with waiters that don't want to wait that long, they want to be in and out. Um, but majority of the time I like to let stuff uh, kind of cure a little bit. So I'll probably wait like another 15, 20 minutes and then I'll put some fluid in it and uh, should be good to go. So we're gonna go ahead and put this other rotor on. This is the fill hole here. You just take your uh, your ratchet, it has the same square head, and um, crack that baby loose. It does have a magnet built in it. Um, actually, I'm gonna just take it out so I can clean it. So all you need, like I said, three eighths ratchet. Just stick it in there. 
break it loose. Then screw it out. And once you screw it out, there's a magnet belt on there on the face of it. And the material that this thing has worn, you can see on my finger, I just dug it out of the actual magnet. So always clean that. Um, you know, so whatever debris, as far as when it breaks in or whatever, it's going to pick up some stuff. You don't want this thing to get too full. Um, it's actually doing its job to try to collect as much uh, material as possible. So you want to clean that. I usually use some brake clean, wipe it out, and uh, you can, when you go to, after you fill it, uh, you can put a little bit of um, Teflon paste on here to help seal it back. Or if you have some right stuff, you can put a little bit on the threads, screw it back in there, hand tight only, um, and then you're good to go. All right, so now I'm gonna fill this baby up. I'll let it sit for a little bit. But as I addressed earlier, we used a Motocraft 75W85 uh, synthetic and a bottle of <clears throat> the Motocraft um, friction modifier. Um, one bottle will do the job. So I'm gonna go ahead and put one quart in first. Okay. I like to pour friction modifier in next. Then pour the leftovers inside of the actual gear oil bottle because it's hard to actually pour to actually squeeze the rest of it out into the rear <clears throat> so I usually just mix it in there with a new filled bottle of gear oil then go ahead and squeeze them in there bottom edge of the actual fill hole um, so I'll, what I usually do is I'll open up another bottle and just fill it till it starts to run out and then once it starts to run out it slows down then I'll cap it off and then she's good to go it looks like she's starting to run out already Here she goes. So now she's starting to run out. So it took two and like a quarter. So usually like three bottles. Are, you're safe if you get yourself three bottles. So pretty much they just want it at this edge. So when it just barely starts to run out, she's actually full. So now she doesn't stop dripping. Well, I should say stop running out. And we're down to a drip. So we're pretty much where we need to be. I'll take the actual drain plug and I'll put a little Teflon paste on it. So this is, I use the ARP Teflon paste. I'm gonna put a little bit on there. It's a thread sealant. A little bit on the threads, like so. So we ain't gotta worry about no leaks. Wipe them down again. And then go ahead and quickly put it in there. And again, you just use a regular 3 8 ratchet.
hand tight. Wipe off the little residual of your, your paste if you want. Make sure it's nice and clean. And that's it. Now it's time to go shake it up a little bit. <laughs> so I usually do on posi units. I'll uh, drive down the road normal. Um, you know, do like a little bit, a little S, like swerve a little bit down the road. Obviously, don't aim for anybody. Um, and then uh, once I do that, I usually go to the highway and make sure nobody's around and do a nice little burnout and a whole shot. And see if she stay together. Not size 10. You ain't got no problems. But that's what we usually do. We make sure the positive is working. And um, that's pretty much it. Well, that concludes uh, <clears throat> a rear end, uh, rear end diff uh, install. And we got a few more upgrades coming on the same vehicle here. Uh, fuel pump upgrade and uh, injectors. And of course, a tune to switch over to some E85 and a little pulley swap. But uh, stay tuned for that and get ready for the Undertaker build. This is the same uh, diff that's in the back of the Undertaker. It's been tried, tested, and I mean, if it held up to me, it can hold up. Fuel pump that we'll be installing is the same one that's currently in the truck as well, uh, JD Solutions. So this diff, the modified diff, so you can, you can contact Rob. You can get this, uh, I believe it's about 400 bucks he's charging for a modified one which is cheaper than one of the other dropping ones that's listed. And it's pretty much the same, same product. Same quality, same name on it. Just a, a different machiner, that's all. So shoot them a call if you're interested in the, the rear diff. For now, Boosted F-150 out.